This is Jesse Hensley. This is Josh Turner. And this is Chris Bow. Welcome to Turn Down for What. Welcome back to Turn Down for What. Another week, another uh, fun lineup today. Uh, today we have the distinct honor of bringing back for the second time, uh, Jace, um, good, good leader in the EV space, uh, kind of heavily uh, involved in uh communications and uh things with ford uh the last time we had john we discussed uh racing and kind of what Mm -hmm. all that uh what that could potentially look like and this was the pre chris bow days um and now since then we have introduced chris uh jesse today is off on a job site um working so we will not have him today but welcome back jace it's great to have you thanks great to be back so today, um, the first thing that we will kind of hit on um, was the announcement that finally came out. Obviously, they announced the GMC Sierra Denali EV coming out. Um, but as of today, um, the day that we're recording this on the 23rd of January, we now have the pricing of the uh, the first Denali, which is the top trim model of that. Uh, Jace, do you want to give us the details on that or would you like me to? Yeah, sure. No, yeah, we just kind of saw it as we were chatting here. <clears throat> just popped up today. So um, I think just their first trim, right? So the the top of the line, Denali 1, Edition 1, I think they're calling it. So um, what, 107000 plus sixteen ninety five in destination delivery charger. So yeah, like 108, just sort of 109000 So not unexpected, I don't think. I think we call kind of all expected that, especially with the the Chevy top of the line trim being just under that. So um yeah, not surprised, but wow, it's it's a lot of money. Um no info right now on the seventy five hundred tax credit either. So um that'll be interesting to see how kind of that affects the lineup. But um yeah, yeah, expensive. You know, I don't think it could qualify, right? Unless they did a lease because it's over eighty. So do you still get it is the technically first... over eighty, right? But uh, did the full policy change where if you're still manufacturing the first quarter million or does that gone too now? I'm not sure. The about cap that, is gone. Yeah, the cap is gone to my knowledge. So they're just basically um, I know they're going to have cheaper trims. I, I would expect one of those to be below the 80,000. You know, darn better cap be. as far as that. Yeah, <laughs> if your cheapest truck is over 80 grand. There's issues involved. <laughs> um, yeah. So they do have big batteries. So, I mean, we'll give them that. You know, you're paying a yeah. lot of battery um there but yeah so um it'll be interesting to see kind of kind of where that goes they are saying that it will have a 200 kilowatt battery so i mean all things considered you know we can we can talk up the competition as far as the lightning um and the other trim models but none of them have that large of a battery now this is only Mm -hmm. estimating an epa range of 400 which for almost double the battery size (laughs) You would hope that uh, apples to apples that you'd maybe get better than 400. Obviously, I don't think the official range has been uh, released yet, but that's the target. Um, But that's one of those things that, you know, ideally for that size battery range, uh, you'd expect more. Um, We were discussing this before we came online. I mean, the Cadillac Escalade, which is a full size SUV, um, will have a 200 kilowatt battery pack through um, through the Ultium platform that they're putting in it. Um, but it will have what they're estimating to be a 450 range. So I'm curious to see how the Denali actually will release. I'm trying to see if they actually have the information on their website now. Um, Something about GM that's interesting too is on those top of the line trims, they throw like, it's like 35 inch tires on there and like 22 yeah, which, inch wheels. Which, so. which could be a large contribution to the lack of um, lack of range. I mean, range. they're still saying on their yeah. website, the range of 400 miles. Um, so, I mean, that's one that efficiency wise, if you look at miles per kilowatt, that's averaging two, which I mean, in our trucks, I think you're supposed to be getting 2.3, but you know, maybe if you decided to buy a $110,000 truck and put smaller than 35 inch rims on it, maybe you could get a, maybe you can get better range out of it, but you know, yeah. apples to apples, that is still a big battery. Um, one of the considerations okay. that you have is when you're dealing with a 200 kilowatt battery pack you need hyper hyper speed charging because you know our you know chris your battery size is what 90 98 98 98 yep 
two times as long <laughs> to charge the 200 kilowatt battery uh, at, a, at a charging stop. My, our mine is 130 for the Lariat extended range. And, yeah. you know, that's it's still a 40 minute wait if I'm only peaking out at 160 uh, in my charge curve. Uh, so in, in order to uh, see a 200 kilowatt charge, if you're only getting 150 delivered, that's going to take a very long time. I mean, yeah, and we've seen really, we've seen really uh, testy numbers as far as it goes. You know, with so far with Altium, I mean, I've seen every all across the board. Um, you know, not a great curve, really, some just inconsistent performance. So it'll be interesting to see if they can really nail that down. They need to, like you said, with such a large pack. Yeah, they, I mean, with the go ahead. Seem like they've just planted their flag in a weird space to me, which is that two hundred kilowatt Hummer. Uh, Silverado now Denali, and they're just seem all in on that for a for an Ultium pack that at least in the states hasn't necessarily done a whole heck of a lot. They're putting a whole lot of resources in into one vehicle. They're all these six figure vehicles, and um, I know they use Ultium overseas to, with a lot of success. And I don't know what's yeah. different or what's going on here. And it's, well, it's, they don't seem to be having those 200 kilowatt hour packs, right? So, like, right. they are they are really successful, and you know they're 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 launching them big time in China. It's just it's a different strategy, though, seemingly too. Um, yeah. So I, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't really understand. We've seen Ford and Doug Field talk extensively about how they don't want to go in that direction, right? Like, we want to we can sell three EVs for the for one you know Hummer EV that they release. So. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting choice for sure. It's yeah, like a speaking I mean, speaking to, to a speak. crowd that that no. is that like it's speaking to a crowd that isn't buying your stuff anyway, right? It's it's talking it's talking to a crowd that wants that that it associates trucks with towing and that is the end of the conversation. But the data shows that is, you know, 15% of the truck market. So it just right. seems like that's uh it's an interesting place and with EVs particularly, it it tends to be um, male dominated, and 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 a uh, and a market of, of people that are center or left of center. So it just seems like an odd thing to do to appeal to like what would seemingly be the the concern. I guess there's an argument to be made that that's a, an untapped market. That that sure, you know. But man, it seems like you would want to try to capture the the family market before that and you'd want to capture the the 75 percent that are already trying to buy these things before you'd go after that 15 or 20 that that use case that like what you throw all this stuff in there and how, how often are you going to tow with and are those hardcore towers even then with five five four hundred gonna go with this right or and then you put the charge port on in on the rear <laughs> which you know right, so, right, so it's right. just these it's these odd choices that just it doesn't really add up to me i mean if they made it make sense you know in some way shape or form then i'd be like yeah totally i get it 450 miles of towing but then you throw the charge port on the rear and it's just like how how do you expect anybody to charge and talk talk to that more, Jace, because I think it, like there's the Cybertruck world has theirs on the rear as well. And as a Lightning owner, we have ours on the front, Rivian on the front. And um, I think there's a lot of people who maybe don't understand why that matters. Um, like talk about that. Yeah, I mean, and I've had so many conversations. I feel like a lot of people have so many different answers on it. I mean, for me, with the truck towing is is large like you said it's is it in reality is it that you know data shows that's not that large, but I still. I still think it makes the most sense for a truck. Um, for me personally, I like being able to come into the garage, plugging my my truck in right at the front there. It's It works perfectly for our setup. I know there's some debate. Some people think passenger side would make more sense. I, 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 I think front driver makes the most sense for me um, in, in, in all the circumstances. I understand that Tesla is sort of built in a different way. The way they build their chargers are a little bit different than maybe EA and others. So... I see for the Tesla ecosystem why maybe that makes more sense, but um, I just I, the the using it as an EV owner every day. I think driver front or if you had to do passenger front makes the most sense. But I know there's there's like really heated opinions out there about it, and I I I, I think a lot of them make sense. I think there's reasons that it makes sense to go in front. I think reasons in the rear. I personally don't see the need for like a standardization of it. I think a lot of people have called for that. 
I don't, I don't really see the need for that. We don't have that with fuel, you know, with gas we've gotten by. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my feelings on it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, opinions, but that's kind of mine. I think yeah. The issue that you stuff. face, the issue that you face with, you know, and I think Chris has experienced this with a lightning, you pull up to a, a magic dock. Um, right. That's Tesla. You're having to like side caddy wamp us in because the those cords are not long enough to reach the truck port that's in the F-150. And, you know, obviously, if you're a Tesla driving a um, and pulling up to, let's say, an EA station and using an adapter, their cords are long enough to where like you can make what wherever the port's located. But mm-hmm. if you want my opinion as a charging station provider myself, make a every station try to standardize pull through because you know yeah evs of the past now were um you know the teslas that could back into these charging stations but if you're bringing vehicles into the market like the 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 uh denali like the hummer like the lightning that all tow and no matter where the port's located if you do pull through charging you can adapt to that just like your gas tank, if it's on the left side or the right side, if you have pull through, pull through, it doesn't matter. Uh, now, yep. obviously, your at home charging preferences can make a difference, but really at home, you can really make anything work. Left yep. side, right side, it depends if you back into the garage or pull forward into the garage. You, it, it's all where your door perhaps. is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if you had a Tesla station that was pull through that you'd pull up to the side of, you could pull all the way up and plug in the back or pull all the way up to the side and plug mm-hmm. straight into the side. Now, obviously, Tesla's ecosystem has been parking lots and on the curb and things like that. But if you look at, in my opinion, the future of the industry has to mimic what the gas stations do, where if you just stick it on the side and let vehicles pull up next to it, then they can control front, back, side, hood, trunk. It doesn't matter. The cord's all right there. No matter what the cord length is, it's a lot easier without having to lug these gigantic cords around the front of our trucks because... I've even been to a couple chargers where uh, like level twos and parking garages where you pull up to the parking spot and the parking spots here and the chargers here. But if you pull forward into the parking garage, I'm running a cable over the hood of my truck and it's barely yeah. long enough to plug into my charge port. And you're not allowed to back in and the cord's not long enough to reach a 25 foot truck to get to the front of it. And so it's really tricky trying to get a level two charger in the parking garage over the hood, trying to get the cord to gently rest. And it's just a headache where, you know, yeah. obviously for that purpose, you have to make it work. But in general, if you can have a system where you can pull up next to these chargers, then it allows it to be adaptable. Either that, or you just have to come up with like the Tesla system and have a 15 foot cable uh, or 20 foot cable rather than a, uh, I, th- I don't know what, I think the current one's 11 or something. It's real small. Yeah, and I think we've seen that Tesla has said that they're gonna they're gonna expand them. You know, I think they're gonna the cables themselves. I do think they're gonna be longer. I think when they, in my personal opinion, when they wanted Nax to become standard, I think they they had to at that moment then agree that they have to make some changes so that it works for everybody. Um, you know, I don't think anywhere in those agreements did it state you need to put your port in the back. You know, um, I think that's a good thing. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll just have to make it work from here. Um, and I think we will. We'll, we've got time, you know, we'll make yeah. it work. All of yeah. our ports will be side by side, you know, pull through driving. So that way you can just pull up with whatever you have and it's right there ready to plug in front, back, yeah. side, center. So that, that's yeah. the ideal situation. Right. And then I, I guess I just expected, you know, if you're kind of going to go after that long distance towing market that with the existing infrastructure of of Electrify America and, and most of the EV goes, you, it's easier to plug in at the front of the truck, even though the back end in your trailer is kind of sticking out into the parking lot. A lot of times these are yeah. in the middle of a, of a Walmart parking lot where it doesn't really matter. And it's not mm-hmm. extremely crowded seen that, you know, obviously pull through is the way to go, but how many years is it going to take to get all these, you know, those things built to where they have enough pull throughs right, right off the highway where you can do those. Cause those well, are, hopefully, those are hopefully the power up America will be in most States yeah. within two years. So here we are. I, yeah. I think, the other the other interesting thing on on it that you know always comes to my mind is just how how innovative Ford is, and I'm curious if if they'll kind of translate their um their tailgate into the Lightning eventually or, or into T3 mm-hmm. because you know I know with their with their Tremor and their newer tailgate for for this year for the ICE vehicles 
it's really set up well for towing because it's got that middle section that pops out mm -hmm. and kind of like the way that they innovated with the frunk. I think they've done a similar thing with the tailgate. Um, and I'm, I was just, you know, the GMC has this traditional tailgate, traditional problems when towing that you can't really lower it down if you've got a, something behind it and you can't use right. that bed. So, I'm or you can and you'll figure it out real quick that that was a mistake. <laughs> that was a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's fun to watch the engineering though. It's fun to, it's fun to see all mm -hmm. that. And, and whether it's the Cybertruck tailgate, I think that, uh, that has some limitations to it or, or this one. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's interesting to see the folks that follow Ford not innovate. And I feel like every time Ford comes out with something, there's a new wrinkle to it um, and a new innovation. And that's what I really enjoy about about the stuff. It's all really tailored well to the people that drive drive these trucks. And I think that long distance is a big question mark to me. I still feel like, it, you know, I don't tow, but if I did, I still feel like I'd go F-250 diesel if I was going to do mm -hmm. something serious towing. Now, if I'm just yeah, doing I'm around just... town, 100 miles, you know, the EVs are fine for that. But yeah, I, I I don't think we're still at the point that you can ever uh, truly justify a tower to use an EV with the current arguments of what's out there, even yeah. with the Denali. I mean, uh, yeah, maybe I mean, if it can actually get, let's say, 200 towing. Sure, maybe. But you're really going to want to see actual range of like 500 on these trucks uh, before you start to see that with fast charging, because it's going to be large battery packs, long charging stops and obviously if you're towing around town and you're going to take your boat for to the lake and back you're fine but if you're yeah. if your job is to tow from here to you know from johnson city tennessee to colorado that's not going to be a uh that's not going to be something that the the ev space is designed for but once again there's innovations like hydrogen that that might be more practical mm -hmm. with and some other um other offerings that could be potentially more beneficial than just a standardized 200 kilowatt battery pack plus uh in that regard because you know even that kind of ties into the next thing i was going to talk about was um you know even with the advertised range you're not always getting there and conditions right. can affect those things and you know there's been now people that have test driven the the, the cyber truck and they've put what the news article was that I was reading about 10,000 miles on it. And they were saying that with their experience with how the, how they've driven the truck, they're only getting what they're estimating to be like 280 miles of range. The two drivers Not that were that. using EV to the yeah. max range with yeah. the full battery was 206 and 164 with an 80% state of charge. Yep. Uh, yeah. So it's like, I, you know, I don't think that's to be unexpected, though, if you're thinking about the temperature that it's driving in, the size yeah. of those wheels, the size of those tires, the type of tires they're putting on them. I think that is all kind of the the reality of of these of these big bulky vehicles. And the United I think States the problem is the promise, right? The promise yeah. of what we were going to get and the price, and the, you know that's that's where Ford differs a little bit from well, a lot of it from Tesla, but but especially even some others where Ford really likes to to under promise and over deliver. They really, really like to do that. Um, where we, and other, other manufacturers do too, but Tesla just does not seem to really like that. They want to try to, to sell it as best as they can. Right. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't really agree with that strategy as most people know, but, um, you know, I think, yeah, that was the difficult part is when you promise alien technology and then you release something that's comparable, uh -huh. even in some ways worse than lightning it's 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 interesting <laughs> now yeah. do you do you switch out yours to snow tires when when you're and what are you using on your range yeah so we don't really have true snow so um on justin's truck we use the ultra trains all the time year round we just we were looking for another set of lariat wheels um that we could throw on like something you know fun but we haven't found one yet so we had, we just have three sets of lari lariat wheels um and we have basically the ultra trains, which are like a, a, a three peak rated, not it's aggressive looking, but it's not really a super, super aggressive treaded tire. Um, that one, they do really well, honestly. I mean, we average 1.9 overall winter, summer with those on, which is about what we averaged with the stocks on um, throughout winter and summer combined, which is the key there. Uh, you know, it's about 2.1, 2.2 in the summer and then about 1.9, 1.7 ish in the winter. And so we average at about 1.9. 
Um, but on my top, uh, my truck, we decided to do like a summer tire, if you will, which was, um, similar to the stock. It was a Kevlar nice. Uh, it's called the Goodyear steadfast is a brand new tire. Actually it's not EV rated at all. Um, but we tried those out. I love that tire. I actually was considering keeping it on my truck during the winter because they have great performance, not three peak rated, but they're just a really, really nice tire, super quiet, great in the rain. Um, and so I had those on and then we started getting a lot of snow. So I threw the other set of ultra trains that we have on my truck and you notice a little bit of a difference, but honestly, I mean, sticking, like, I think I said, we were in a conversation with Joe Hertz or the other day, if you, as long as you don't level, you keep the same stock uh, tire size, you keep the same stock wheel size. I think you can come pretty close to what stock tires give you. Um, as long as you keep those big three things kind of, you know, close, you can get really close unless it's like a super, super heavy, light truck rated tire or something. But other than that, I think you get close. Yeah. I have the stock tires on. And I mean, obviously um, where I'm at, I don't get a ton of snow. We've had, I mean, the whole nation got some level of snow pretty much over the past couple of weeks, but I had two inches, three inches best worst on the worst day. And so like I stock tires are more than fine for my use case. And, yep. you know, with that application around town, I'm seeing 2.5 efficiency. Yeah. And on the highway, I'm seeing about 2 to 2.1 um, yep. and maybe 1.9, depending on the, the trip. But lifetime average for my vehicle is 2.1 uh, or 2.2. Yeah, um, con- so, I mean, contrast, contrast that to California. I'm getting 2.7 around town <laughs> and, in the in the winter right and i can i can get three during during the spring the summer you know with ac it comes back down again still to 2.7 um because i don't have those extremes right but yeah i've had as high as as high as three i average 2.7 around town and then the whole lifetime of the truck it, it's sitting at about 2.4 um that that's great but that's one California, variable. right? Yeah. yeah, and the variable difference there is, I mean, where I'm at, I'm sure where uh, Jace is at, it's the same way. But the the cold does play a factor on the yep. uh, the performance. I mean, I uh, left the via- the house this morning or yesterday morning, and my battery life was at like seventy eight percent state of charge, roughly, and my range was advertised at one eighty. Now, obviously, that's all different depending on how it actually performs. Um, but, you know, if I would have been at full charge, I would think it would have trended to be about 20 percent it less than the, you know, advertised range. Um, but that's something that with the cold, you kind of have to expect that. And you can do preconditioning and things like that to kind of help you out. The only issue is my vehicle right now is not allowing preconditioning. I have to take it into. Uh, yeah, we're going to have that is the whole that. module update and it's still not working. I, I got another fault. Yeah. This oh, morning, wow. But, okay. It charges fine, but then in the morning when it tries to precondition, it uh, keeps faulting. I don't know if it's the charger's problem or the truck's problem, but the last time they went and tried to fix something in my truck, they ended up like breaking the charge port and had to replace the whole thing. So I think it's something to do with the truck. I wonder if they left something unplugged. Like something's not plugged that it should. Yeah. Well, the reason I brought it in in the first place was that issue. Um, and then did they said also... that they had to do a mo- they did a module update, and they said maybe that'll fix it, and then they fried the whole charge port. Are you uh, hardwired or do you use fourteen fifty? Uh, it's hardwired. Okay, I was going to so say because I had the, the problem. Charger. Okay, I had the same problem, but it actually ended up being our outlet. We would we would fault the charger every time we tried to precondition, but it ended up being the outlet. And I'm glad I switched out. I put a tweet out about this because it was like close to you know, starting on fire, um, like really, really close. Um, it was melting and everything. And so I had no idea they actually even used a Leviton outlet when they, when they installed the charger, they said, no, it's, it, it was a nice quality one. And I just believed them, didn't really even think about it. And then we started like looking at it and we're like, Oh, I don't know. And took it apart. And it was Leviton outlet. <laughs> that, that was going to be my first question is what outlet did they put in there? Cause it's, uh, yeah, man, it it's, that is so tragic how often that happens with, with an electrician, you know, doing it. They just I, don't know. I have any my better. pro charger professionally yep. wired in, but I even the 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 um first round of pro chargers uh was having a difficult time with the actual power. So yeah. I wired mine in with a hundred amp breaker. And if I charged it at a hundred amps, like that at its like eighty amp or whatever the, the max yeah. capacity is with a hundred amp breaker, the charger kept faulting. 
Um, like it would, it, it would fault and then restart and charge and fault and restart and charge. And then I went into the charger settings in my phone and, and turned it down from 80 amp to 60 amp and it's not faulted since. And so I think it was the huh. charger itself was overheating. Um, and I think that's just a year one, uh, you- model one version of the charger issue. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I they sent out a it. firmware. They sent out a firmware update actually on that, um, the charge station pro to change its like tolerances were not, you know, its sensor tolerances were basically set too low. And so I probably in a should hot update day, it. this was a year and a half yeah. ago when I got the truck. Um yeah, but yeah that, hot that's day, something it would just that stop. Yeah, I, I dealt with it, kept faulting. Um, but now yeah. I don't think it's the charger issue, but it could be. Um, but that's something I have to diagnose, which it's just really an inconvenience of preconditioning, but that's a, a minor thing overall to have to deal with. So do you sure. have uh do you have copper or aluminum? Do you happen to know? I've uh check out your wires. I've I, I've heard that that if um that if it's copper, it's that's what you want, but aluminum, um, which it could be by code rated to do, that aluminum uh isn't quite as good. And people that are going full power with the aluminum were experiencing those problems as well. So check your firmware and check if your if your if your wires are copper or aluminum. Both when I got the- my firm, when I got my, so I, I started when I first bought my truck, and for about two months I used the uh, just the two twenty uh, regular wall Mobile, charger. Yeah, and yeah. I put I put in temporarily. I was waiting for my main charger to show up because I was so early in the adoption. It took them like a month to get me my charger. But I immediately put a, a 240 into my garage and used that charger. And it was almost enough, but I was doing enough road trips that I would come home with zero at 10 o'clock at night and like a 5%. And then the next morning, wake up and it was only at like 60%. And I have to go drive all day long. And so I was like, I really just need to go ahead and step it up and get the, uh, the pro charger. So I wired it in uh, when it came in. Uh, but then, you know, even at the reduced power, I've not ever had an issue where I've, ne- I've needed more power, quicker power. That thing can charge my truck in like four and a half hours. So yeah, I've not needed it, but that's something that, uh, I'll try the firmware update and see if it operates at full capacity just, just to do it. So, yeah, I, I started anyways. using the mobile charger, um, when I first got the truck and then ended up upgrading to, uh, after I burned out my first one. And then, and then my second one started having intermittent problems where I had like a fan blowing on it. Um, and I just reading, reading all the stuff on the forums. It just seemed like that was something that was happening. And I didn't want to blow it out again because one of the things I really like about that charger is that, um, I guess it's more the pigtail than the charger technically, but it can, it's one of the few that can give you the full 30 amps out of the back of your truck. You know, otherwise you got to mm-hmm. anything off the shelf. You're going to have to step down to 24. Um, or you're going to blow that breaker. But this, you know, the one that comes with the lightning does allow you to go full 30 off the back of your truck. So I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't want to burn this thing out. And I just went and got like a, in my case, I got a Tesla wall connector. And um, cause they made, I thought it was cool. They made the one with the J one seven, seven, two, and it was black, which is the color of my truck. And so I was like, ah, cool. I'm going to put that in there. Um, but yeah, I wanted to save that, that mobile charger because it, I just don't think it's meant, they say you can do it, but I don't, I don't know. I didn't want to blow it out. You know, I wanted to use it for the cool thing that it could do, which is to charge. Tesla. We used it for, uh, my gosh, 11 months. I think when we had our Mach-E, we did wow. not put anything in there yet. We put, we used it for 11 months. Um, it actually worked great. We had no problems with it, to be honest with you. It That's worked cool. great, it, it, but it was attached to the wall. We had it, you know, like in, on the, the rack mounts, you know, and, um, yeah, it, it worked really well. Never had a problem with it, but yeah, it was, it was, um, we needed something, especially once we got, you know, both trucks, we were like, all right, now we have to do something, but we did the grizzly duo. And honestly, wow. that thing has been great. It's not smart. It's not, doesn't have anything to it. No, you plug it in and it charges. That's all you can ask but of it. That's what we love about yeah. it. You know, I can control everything else really from the truck. Um, you know, it, it was just, it's, it's been great. Um, I tank. would love for, yeah, it is. I would love for it to have some fun stuff, you know, eventually, but for now it works great for us. It, it like you said, you plug it in, it works. And is it, kind is of, it inside or outside? It. It's inside. Ours is okay. inside. So, um, but we had to kind of run it. We got a Leviton extender, uh, 40, full 40 amp extender. So that goes out through a hole in the garage that we got in the wall and that goes through like a cable hatch cover and then, we can charge both trucks at the same time, but it, it's a it's a great setup and and it, and it was cheap relatively, you know, yeah. comparative to what we could have spent. 
So, and I sold the Ford Charger for like thirteen hundred bucks. Somebody bought wow. it on eBay way back when they were still like you know pricey, you know, and people were looking yeah. for them. They were sold out, and guy jumped on it on eBay for thirteen hundred bucks. I was like, okay, it's that's great, sir. man. Yeah, the Grizzly, <laughs> yeah. is, the Grizzly is a tank. It's it's a it's great. It's a you know, you're gonna buy that thing. You won't need another one for ten years. Those things are solid. The yeah. And it was a great the, option for us. Most of the cars can't take advantage of the 80 you were getting out of the Ford Charge Station mm-hmm. Pro anyway, other than the Lightning and maybe the older Teslas, right? Could the S could yes, do it? Right. Is there anything else that would take 80? I think it's a pretty limited group. Lucid? Uh, yeah, Lucid I think can any more. 80. Can they? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Lucid yeah. can do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, and with ours too, we, you know, my truck doesn't do it. You know, my standard range doesn't go all the way up like Justin's does with the AC charging. So, for us to have the non-smart grizzly duo, you know, plug in, boom, work every day, that it's been great. Yep. Hmm. Well, there you go. Well, there was a little tangent off of our uh Yeah. <laughs> I don't even Easy know where we started at. Was that the GMC uh, uh, Hummer that we ended yeah. up talking about charging ports? But that that's the way this goes. Uh right. to tie it back to the GMC Hummer, uh, you know, the Denali, large battery. The Denali. Denali. Yeah. yeah. The large yes. battery packs and that whole game, you know, GMC's built their foundation on this large battery pack. And we were talking about that. The, the point I was going to make at that time was, you know, look at the Hummer sales. <laughs> the uh, I think they were I was looking at some of the sales numbers for last year, but like the Hummer in Q3 of 23 sold 874 units. And all like of the about Q3. as many as they probably built too. That's no, the sad yeah, part, but I mean, like know. that. It's not a pop. Like it's not a widely demand. You know, like everybody's giving flack to Ford for cutting down from two hundred thousand estimated production down to like I think it was seventy five or whatever the number is. And it's like that's still a, like a hundred times more than what the EVs, the Hummer EVs, going to sell just because it's such a niche. And it shows and really that it's, not, not everybody's it's just looking to back buy of the plant. Yeah, yeah, and I, no, I will, nobody's looking to to buy a $120,000, 200 yeah. kilowatt battery pack. I think, you know, you see the demand and the, the lightning pro and stuff, which is still actively there. I think the demand that needs to be filled is not the $108,000 Denali, but maybe the $50,000, whatever base model is, because that's what's going to be in highest demand. Well, that, that was yeah. totally my, my, yeah, I will die on this Hill and repeat it until people are nauseated by my repeating it. But the, you know, I, I get into these back and forth all the time about, um, you know, Ford loses X amount of money, blah, blah, blah. And they're, you know, they're cutting their production in half. And I'm like, God, stop it. So like, you know, Tesla or Amazon, if you want to go to someone different, lost hundreds of billions of dollars of investment capital, you know, and Ford is doing it on their ice profits, which to me is awesome that you're taking ice profits, reinvesting them in, into something that is that is going to be into the future you're yep. um and if you look at the sales of, of of these things to your point right the model x if if you take ford and they hit 50,000 this year um which you know the original target way back in you know 21 was you know uh you know 30,000 maybe and it went up to 80 and then it things got crazy and maybe I over their mm-hmm. skis got up to 150 and then you know, okay, mm-hmm. they're really right back where they said they were going to be in 2021, right? They're, they've yeah. come right back to those original estimates. They got a little, little, you know, happy there. But if you if they were to hit 50,000, that is more than the Model X has ever sold in a year, ever. There has never mm-hmm. been a year that the Model X has sold 50,000. And if you look at how many years and that the Model S took to sell 50,000, it was like four years. And so when you, just for perspective, right, uh, the 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 losses on these things early on are not nearly what they were to ramp up Tesla. Obviously, Ford is an exim- existing company, but they're ramping up electric. And the the going from fifteen thousand the first year to twenty five thousand, if you could hit fifty, that's a doubling of production. It, it is a it is a scaling back of projections. That's still yeah. that that word still <laughs> starts with the letter P, but they are different words. You are yeah. scaling back production. That that's different than scaling back a projection. R- production, what is actually produced, would be a one hundred percent increase, and the projection would be cut. And I, I wish they'd done a better job of of that being out there. And it 
it just one of those well, things the average the crazy. average narrative is out to dog the ev industry as a whole so in that yeah. regard yeah they they get the upper hand to win on that one but if anybody intellectual actually looks at the numbers they can see that somebody's brought in a brand new industry and that they're doing just fine for what they're doing and we still at the beginning of this curve they're still they have not stopped producing and building blue oval city they, they've not yeah. cut back on their investments. They're about to open a $5 billion facility that is going to be housing their EV production facilities. So it's not like Ford's like, oh, we're out of EVs. It's one of those things that they just are being strategic with their funding, which I would hope if you're a company and you're looking at your bottom line, that you're going to yep. be constantly monitoring demand and you're adjusting for those things and not just wasting money just to look good. So yep. respect to a company that's actually willing to go out and run a business the way it should be run and to sell what you produce and to increase production at the time that it's appropriate. So good on you for being a good business there. And I, yep. I think that's Amen. where they need to be. I think you've got, you know, I'm, I, I need Tesla to be strong. I really want Rivian to hit something close to profitability by the end of this year that we need them to be there. We need Ford to get this right with T3. And I think they're on track for that. Little worried about Stellantis. Not sure what they're when they're going to get in and join us, you know. And and then you know, God, the, wa- God bless the Wagoneer. GM. The Wagoneer EV did have some, uh, I think, uh, mm-hmm. information drops this week, and it does it does look pretty nice. It does look I mean, good. That's that's a tangent that we didn't originally intend on talking about. You can continue your point while I Google it. But yes, the Wagoneer EV does look pretty nice. Yeah, I, I just feel like I, I look over the horizon at BYD and they scare me. They scare me because oh, yeah. they're doing some really fun, innovative things. I think I think Kia Hyundai are doing some cool stuff. At least they're, you know, an ally. I, I worry about the future, whether it's supply chain or, you know, did we not lose? Did we not learn anything from COVID and how disruptive it was? We we need a robust U.S. manufacturing infrastructure. We need these people to pivot to vertical integration the way Tesla has done, the way Ford is is looking to do better at. Um, we we need these companies to succeed, and and if eventually BYD is going to come to our shores, and whether that's through Mexico or whether that's through the way that Volkswagen and and Hyundai Kia Group are doing it by building factories in the U.S., they will show up. And if the only competition for them when they arrive is Tesla, we're in deep trouble. And and so I I love the idea of you know, obviously I'm biased, like full disclosure. I love what Ford's doing. I love that. You know, Jim Farley was like, uh, you know, oh, escape EV. No, no, no. Let's do Mustang. Like, I love I love that idea. Mm-hmm. We're going to make fun. That's going to be their pocket. Right. The fun, you know, innovative uh, software defined vehicles. They I think, you know, with reasonable battery packs for the every man uh, or every woman, as it would be. Right. Um, and I, I think to me, that's much more fun than what I'm seeing from this idea of 200 kilowatt hour hundred thousand dollar vehicles from gmc and and i don't want to they're do definitely anyway. fun yeah they're definitely fun in certain ways right but but they're also i i don't think they have the data to offer a luxury experience for luxury price at least from what i've seen yet you know yeah, a lot of people are having issues there's got to be a ceiling on that and kind of to my point earlier about the model x right and the model x until recently was a hundred thousand dollar vehicle very much a premium vehicle, or at least that's where the the you know the space it was in, and so you're competing yeah. against the BMWs, and you're competing against the Porsches, and you're competing against that kind of luxury aspect. And there is a cap to how many people can buy that, and yeah. we're not, we're not going to be able to hit what we need to hit for EVs if that's where we keep coming out. We've, we need to we, we've said this like fifty times. We need affordable yeah. EVs. Um, we need a used EV market to flourish um, mm-hmm. because Hertz the world is trying of, to help. Yeah. <laughs> but the world of one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar EVs is Crazy. a limited space, and yes, there's going to be vehicles sold. But like the Hummer EV, do you want to run a facility in a line that produces and sells a thousand vehicles a quarter, or would you want to be running a line that's going to sell a quarter million ah. vehicles a year? Uh, that's just, that's the kind of difference that it makes. Um, to tie into the Stellantis point, I pulled it up. They didn't drop much information, but they dropped a teaser video showing a little bit about it. The photos look pretty cool. I love the Wagoneer. I actually owned, I bought one for my wife, the the base Wagoneer. It, was a, it wasn't the Grand. It was the Series 3 uh, regular Wagoneer. 
and it was having some engine issues in year one um modeling i mean we were one of like the first three people to get one in our area so like it was just having some issues and we ended up trading it in for a ford expedition um however the wagoneer was just all around us an impressive um vehicle sharp look and they've gotten better from what i've heard as far as the tech and the grand wagoneer still stands kind of as the complimentary to the escalate as far as luxury suvs go um but they announced that they were doing the uh they actually put a post out asking for opinions on what they should name the wagoneer ev and i I sent in a response asking like like telling them that they should do something that was you know tied into exploration and like everest or something like that because a lot of what they have is um high in ev to everest i see what you're doing there yeah yeah but uh, they came out and they named it the Wagoneer S. I was like, oh, how creative of you. That's so what, creative. Good job, what's the guys. S? What's the S for? I don't know. They just they, they were like, yeah. oh, let's throw an S on it. That, that works. That's a good the that's Do a naming Wagoneer. competition and then they yeah. didn't listen to anybody's names. But the photos are online. There's some uh, preliminary photos. But what they have released is they're anticipating um, basically a 400-mile range, maybe with the larger battery up to 500. Uh, but they're mm-hmm. saying zero to sixty and three point five, so that's pretty okay. good output for a uh, for an SUV. But that's going to be the Escalade IQ's competition when it comes in as a full size SUV. But that was a tangent for Stellantis's uh, EVs, but a sharp looking one overall if you look it up. So yeah, definitely, I agree. I, I, obviously, I don't know nothing about nothing, but man, I hope that when Ford ramps up their T three line, that there somewhere in there is like that Bronco Sport that. You know, something just uh, that thirty thousand dollar offering that some that just my wife can buy. You know, because yeah. this vehicle after vehicle being released at a hundred grand and two hundred kilowatt hour batteries, I'm like, how many people in society can be buying these things? It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then and then it's like, oh, there's no demand for EV. I'm like, ah, demand for EV is growing every single year. But you know who's selling it? It's the uh, it's it's Kia EV6. It's you know mm-hmm. it's ID ID fours. It's uh the model threes it's you know There's the reason the nissan leaf was so so popular it's because well, it was cheap and it was the very like one of the first evs on the market and you know there just needs to be a market where they can produce some sort of vehicle that is obviously the margins aren't the same but they need to produce a vehicle that's 35 40 000 at the top end uh and i think the, that's the tough part though to those margins you know it's yeah. hard to sell the to the company the uppers you know that we're going to build this but we're only going to make three four percent that's tough to sell when especially with a company like ford right where their bread and butter is trucks and they've they've largely exited the car market so yeah um, Yeah. not that they can't not that they can't build an affordable you know maverick eb i mean they can it's just it's a harder sell off the bat um you know on the bottom line than it is to build you know a, a lariat F-150. Absolutely. That's another that's another great point there though, Jace, is that um when when we keep coming out as American companies with these types of things, whether it's the Denali or the Wagoneer or all these things, these are things that you you couldn't even sell these. I mean, you could sell them, I guess, in 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 like England or something, right? But you need a special license. Like these things are considered mm-hmm. commercial. Yeah. Co- literally, like we would have, you know, the like a diesel truck driver. That's what's required, that kind of license to drive this yeah. in some places of Europe. And so yeah, if you if you get that that Maverick, if you get that Ranger, those things are huge sellers worldwide. So you, that's where I think their thing needs to be is these these companies need to scale. And I, I do hope they trust the truck. I do hope, you know, that to me, a Bronco is still a truck chassis and, you know, the, the Maverick, the Ranger. I know they're different than the full size trucks, but they're still truck ish like that brand. I would love to see that. I would love to see them pumping these things out at a scale because that's the only way you're going to be able to make the cost come down. And yeah. a big, a big thing that's harder for all these guys over Tesla is that, you know, 40% of the, of the OEM companies, the, the traditional legacy companies, they make their money off service. And there's a lot less of it required when you're talking about EVs. And so yeah. there's, you know, 50% of Ford's dealers aren't even participating in, in model E on this first round. So there's so many gaps there, right. To try to, that, it's got to be bigger. It's got to be something compelling that's going to, because there's only so much market at that high top end. And if you don't find something to scale, if you don't find your, your special vehicle, that gets that thing out there. And, and so I'm really hoping, 
I'm really hoping that's what we see here in 2025. And, and see. every every OEM is going to have a niche. But, yep. you know, the reason yeah. that the number one EV in the world is the Tesla Model, Model y. y yep, is, in my opinion, because you have an EV that is new and has basically everything basic that you'd want for purchase price 43, tax incentive 35. And like what Chris said, I think it works in so many countries. You know, yeah, I think that's yep. so huge. That's something we have to remember. I I always have to remember too in my head that, you know, Ford is Ford is really pushing the U.S. market, right? Like they for what they're trying to sell, it's geared a lot towards the U.S. market. There's other emerging markets, right, like Australia and these other places that in Norway is one that they want bigger vehicles. They don't necessarily, their infrastructure doesn't necessarily support it, but they want it. They need it. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, these people have cabins, they're towing stuff up to those cabins. Um, you know, so, but at the same time, you know, cyber, we're never probably going to see cyber truck in Europe. We're never going to see, we might not even see cyber truck in Australia. Um, so, bringing, you know, we just bringing... got F-150, just got F-150 in Australia, which is crazy to me. They're bringing Cybertruck to China. Did you see that? They shipped. Uh, I'm curious what that's but, about. Yeah, well, and they may they kind of have a little bit more of an infrastructure where it may you know work. They got some space over there, you know, compared to like yeah. Europe and stuff. But um, yeah, it's it's fascinating to see the the strategies right that everybody kind of is. And I'm that's why I've always said there's so much room in my opinion in the auto market. It's not like the smartphone market. It's not like you know the TV market where dominate you know people just dominate. Um, each country has a lot of different, you know, things that, that, that they will support different automakers on. So it, I don't know, it's going to be fascinating to see. I think we'll see some like Tesla has that, you know, world's best selling car. And I think we'll see that, but I don't think we'll ever see that car hit 50% market share or these crazy, you know, things that we people that we see people say, and- I, I think Ford can stay in their line and just be the electric truck producer um, because yeah. they like, like you said, that's not, they've kind of gotten out of the car industry, which is true. I mean, they've scaled back on production of a lot of things and they're the best case I think is the escape. Maybe if they even still make that, but I mean, like they're sticking with Explorer or, or bigger and that's fine. Electrify, mm-hmm. you know, you can electrify your fleet and have your niche, but if you see a rise in something like the Kias, which are proving to be yeah. very highly marketable, uh, the Hyundai, uh, is the it EV6. the, yes. And the EV look at the Ford Explorer, European Ford Explorer. Yeah. I mean, they can yeah. easily but, bring that here too. If they did decide, you know, you'll see, that. you'll see better sales numbers on those things than the trucks just because of, of up front, just because of the affordability. And then obviously yeah. as, comfortability increases you'll see a, a leader like ford with trucks take over and dominate that market whereas of right now they're kind of um sharing with rivian and some of the other um providers but that's something that right now i think that you, you're still in the early curve you're about to see a big adoption especially with charging infrastructure improvements and things and we need to see um you know affordability brought into the space and i don't think ford's outside of the realm if they can actually get back to where you can buy a pro for 40,000 or whatever at 49 that it is now in my opinion that's great but you need to be able to actually make them and sell them and not have yeah. that not be only able to order a lariat and platinum at 90,000 um but if you can get that market where you can buy a brand new uh f150 pro and you can get it for fifty thousand dollars. Get your tax credit, be it like forty two thousand dollars in. Then I I think that they'll be fine with selling a, a lot of numbers as long as their margins can make that work. So and let's not forget it? Ford Pro. Ford Pro is like huge. That's something that some nobody nobody talks about. I've been preaching Ford Pro for the last three years because it is huge. Like yep. I, the software behind it, the integration with the fleets and uh, you know, Ford's already dominates the van, you know, it, like, you know, it, Ford dominates when it comes to commercial vans. I mean, I think Rivian's going to be a huge player there too, but really I don't see maybe Dodge with their, their new little, their new van that they've got, but yeah. Ford is huge when it comes to this. And um, I think money maker right there. I really think oh, yeah. that 
that is a huge market that people just don't quite get yet. But in goods, in goods and services, the amount of vehicle quantity that they go through is impressive, and I think that's a, a huge market. I mean, Rivian was really smart to dive into that now. Um, Very I think, yes, I think that uh, Ford has already adapted, and obviously in Dodge, who has a space in that field currently, but they're they're adapting to that too because it's one of the most practical use cases for um, EV. Uh, transport is yeah. those local de- package deliveries. I mean, uh, there was actually an announcement yesterday, two days ago, that the post off postal service was getting into EV fleets. But it makes sense yep. because they're yep. running these little routes that they can run, charge it overnight, and the next morning be ready to go. So, I mean, those those use cases <laughs> like that are perfect niche type things for delivery services uh, to yep. be able to operate those to that extent so and that's what i've got here at my location i've got the the e-transit i had the e-transit before i had the lightning and um you know we we make the adjustment for the winter where we precondition and, and have it ready to go for our driver that gets here at 6 a.m and uh, again yep. it's still california so the, the winters are still miles but we know exactly what his route is and we know exactly where his miles are going to be and um and and the little things just logistically right in terms of when you've got to do oil changes and you've got to take it off route for, for a day or two and wait to get it back and get another vehicle and all these things that we don't have to deal with, with an EV, you know, they don't have to go gas it up at the, at the end of the shift, they just pull it up and plug it in. And so it's, there's these little, little things that throughout the business day matter and make a difference and start to add up. And if you have that fleet software and you can really get a lot of data behind it, there's, there's a ton of value there that, you know, the, the retail consumer doesn't necessarily see, but when you're running a fleet the size of, you know, FedEx, for example, you definitely see it on a mm-hmm. national scale. And and those parts availability and all those types of things that keep your vehicle up and going, that's mm-hmm. an advantage that that Ford, you know, needs to leverage because that's something that traditionally Tesla struggles. And I think Hertz saw some of this, right? With that's a yeah, fleet I agree. business there that I think I think they don't have that that Ford Pro part of of Tesla yet. Um which made me, I, I will say about this, that it made Tesla's run so much more impressive, in my opinion, that they were able to do what they have done in strictly a consumer mindset in a consumer market. There, There is no B2B really there at all. Um, and that is that is very, very impressive that they were able to do that. Like you said, with Rivian pivoting to B2B, I think they learned a lot of that from Ford and their investment. Um, and... I just I just find that very impressive that Tesla was able to do that without going that direction that you know Rivian has chosen to do. And Rivian Absolutely. had that partnership with Amazon that really helped them out a ton. And so yeah. they got to, you know, before they rolled it out to a wider market, they really experimented, iterated, learned from their mistakes, and now they're ready yep. to go to market. T- Tesla in traditional style, man, move fast and break things. They just they just mm-hmm. threw it out there and went. And credit to them, yep. you know. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Do uh do we want to pivot over to we kind of touched on T three a little bit in the future what that looks like and we saw a a, a slight glimpse with the Lincoln yep. that was uh, was the Lincoln that just was released and they they had that screen the Nautilus yeah Nautilus yep yeah I mean I think uh, I was I was really excited to see that and you mentioned earlier uh, Doug Field was in was in that release when they talked about that kind of moving pivoting from a software connected vehicle to a software defined vehicle it's a that is a big a big step and i think a peak, peak behind the curtain man what, what did you think about that yeah i completely agree um it, it's the first big uh release right for this this next generation thing that we've kind of seen delayed a couple times right we've seen you know we kind of thought 2024 light or 2023 lightning would it would right. release on uh, it didn't really come. Um, in my opinion, I'm happy about that. Um, I, I think Ford really took their time to make a system that, um, you know, works for everyone, offers choice, um, but maybe is ready for release. I think we've kind of seen that um, GM's Blazer infotainment yes. issues among Lyric as well. Sadly, um, they weren't quite ready yet, uh, 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 as well as kind of... Uh, really diminishing people's choices right on top of not being ready that's a that's a killer in my opinion you know you 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 need it ready if you're really going to force people into a choice it has to be ready for those folks you can't have it be half 
ass to be completely honest. And that's just kind of really what it seems like so far. So I'm hoping the same, you know, that happens with, you know, Ford slash Lincoln that, that this system is ready to hit the, the, the runway going. I mean, I know it's, it's going in China um, now already. So they have that to pull from, although that hasn't really worked for GM as we've seen, Um, (laughs) but hopefully with Ford, it does hopefully that they'll, they'll be able to, to have that hit the ground running and be ready to go. I mean, it looks incredible. Um, The displays are, are next level Um, hearing, you know, some of the engineers talk about it and, the benefits that it offers. I mean, I know I, I tweeted this earlier today um, from our good friend, Chris, at, that works for Ford. So five times faster main processing, 14 times faster graphics processing, four times the memory and eight times the storage. Um, huge. That's, that's huge. Awesome. I, yeah. I would love to see more details on that even, um, yeah. you know, down to the, the nitty gritty. But I mean, I think that even just that is where I've wanted to see Ford go for a long time. Um you know, uh, what I love about Apple and what I, I, I have to say I do love about Tesla as well is that d- the details of the tech the, that us nerds really want to see. Um, it, because I really do think younger people sell to that sort of stuff. You know, I just bought a new OLED, OLED TV and those those little details that I learned comparing it to my old OLEDs and just those little things, um, they hook me. And I want to see more from Ford. They put out a video um, once about the hardness of the 15.5 inch display. They like took a hammer to it. Oh, like, no, they didn't. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. I'll have to find it. It's on YouTube. I'll send it to you if I can find it. Oh. It's really cool. But those little things are those things that I want to see from Ford. I want to see these. Um, I'd love to see a better sound system. Those little things that you can sell to people. Um, that the younger generation really does care about, particularly EV buyers, which is key, right? Like they might not care about that on the ice F one fifty side, but us on the EV side, a lot of people are gonna gonna want that kind of stuff. And I think Doug Field is really pushing yeah. that, um, but also um, con- con- condensing. You have to do it, and the company has to make money, right? So. You can do it in all these ways, but you have to still make sure the profits are there, especially with a big company like Ford. You know, the uppers want to see profits. I think one of the biggest things, and we've mentioned this, I think, two or three times, but one of the biggest things that Ford's done recently is they hired Peter Stern uh, coming out of Apple. And he was single-handedly responsible for basically the oversight of uh, Apple TV, the iCloud, mm-hmm. Apple News, Apple Books, Apple Arcade, Apple One, Apple Fitness, like all of that was the same that yeah. he oversaw. And so bringing in somebody like that, his expressed role at Ford uh, under, you know, basically being brought in was to help build out the Blue Cruise experience, uh, but then to imagine basically and deliver new high value services for their clientele. Um, and then yep. help, you know, obviously drive the business forward. But coming from somebody that's coming from the Apple space as a leader like that, I mean, obviously these type of systems that we're coming out with, he has to have his hands, I'm sure, involved in. And, and for the Apple fans, what's really great that Ford did is even though it's going to be based on the the Android automotive, which is distinct and different from Android Auto. Android Auto, right. Yeah. And so, like, you know, we have Android Auto and we have Apple CarPlay. This is going to be, you know, where everything is hosted on our phones. And I know, like, from my experience, right, my charging pad cannot keep up with when I'm doing Android Auto. It, it'll it drain the battery. It, there's just, it just doesn't have the power and it doesn't have the, it just uses too much on the phone. So I actually have to still plug it in. Like if I know I'm going to be doing heavy use on Android Auto for a trip and you doing a lot of podcast listening or music listening or even, you know, YouTube, I'll throw it on to hear, you know, big, long uh, Kyle videos that go for an hour or two. And I'll just listen to the audio portion. Right. That is all pulling a lot of uh, a lot of data and it's doing a lot of stuff on processing on the phone and it gets hot. Like I'll mount it right over my air conditioning vent. And plug it yeah. in hardwired <laughs> yeah. to try to keep it keep it okay. But with Android Automotive, the host is the computer itself, and then it's all your points. Jace is five times more powerful, and it's got all this different different space and and all these different apps that are going to be compatible with it, and all of these integration that now doesn't drain your phone. And then what's really cool is for the Apple fans, it still is going to support importantly um, your 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 Apple CarPlay, CarPlay. absolutely. Yeah. So you don't lose that. GM has stopped doing that, and so. I love that Ford is doing that. And then I, 
you know, we talked before about obviously the U.S. market, you know, Apple is the dominating, you know, probably 60, 40 worldwide. Mm -hmm. Again, if they're looking at selling Mavericks and Rangers and these vehicles worldwide, Android is the biggest one worldwide. Apple, still, it's like the reverse is 60, 40 worldwide to Android. Um, right. So having that that Android automotive opens you up to all of these great engineers, software engineers, and innovative things that are out there. Whether mm -hmm. it's India, whether it's China, whether it's parts of Asia, um, all of these great uh, minds that can develop things for your system without having to go ground up the way a Tesla would be. Um, I love that they're not trying to taste chase Tesla in that way, but are still trying to go with that that software integration in a Tesla esque kind of way. Yeah, definitely. No, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see. I mean, I don't know if you guys have watched the capital market stuff, but Doug Field had just a really, really cool breakout where he literally like talked, you know, in depth about all of this. And it was so cool to see how he's integrating, you know, what we're talking about right now, but also making it make sense in money for the company, you know, so he's offering basically three display options, you know, before each team could kind of decide like, okay, we want this display. You know, that's why Maki -E looks different than lightning and like, you know, and all vice versa. Now there's going to be three choices. You get, you know, the, the Lincoln one. I think there's one that looks like the Maki. -E, and I think there might be one more that looks kind of like the lightning. And basically like, those are your choices. It's simplified all the teams. You can kind of, you know, you still have free reign and some stuff, but like when it comes down to the, what's going to make the company money and the supplier network, how we're going to get these, you know, displays out quick enough and stuff, you're going to have to choose between these three. Um, and it, it's, it's fascinating to see the way that he's going to be able to combine the, the, the traditional aspects of what makes Ford successful with the new up and coming technology that is also going to make, you know, hope, hopefully Ford successful. So, and, and keep up more importantly, like, with what you said with Rivian and Tesla, but do it in the Ford way, right? And I think it's going to make those updates, those OTAs easier to do because I think in the yeah. current model with all the modules, there's a ton of of OTAs we'd like to see and we've heard feedback on. I just think it's hard to do. I think it's really hard. Right I think now. it's hard to do. And I think honestly, a lot of issues that we've struggled with are the 12 volt uh, battery monitoring sensor as well. I think that has held some things back. We've struggled with it ourselves and having OTAs fail. And so I think now that we are getting past that, we've got the CSP out for people to get this battery monitoring sensor replaced. I really do think that will make a big difference for folks. Um, and yeah, I think it, it, it's going to pick up steam. I really do believe that. But I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Ford, not all, like for, in my opinion, I, I don't know the facts on this, but this is just me throwing this out there as I've been thinking about it. I think Ford, out of any manufacturer, sends the most OTAs to the most different nameplates than any other manufacturer. It's crazy when you think about it. Like Maverick, Mustang, Bronco, Ranger, Expedition, Everest over in Europe. I mean, all of these nameplates that Ford has to send updates to. Um, you think about the F-150, we've got hybrid, we've got ice, we've got, you know, EV. It's, it's just, it's crazy to think about the amount and, and, and it all that's fragmentation, right? It all has and each of those are coming modules are coming from different manufacturers, different suppliers. I mean, it's just crazy when you, you kind of start to, to divvy it up, like how many nameplates there are under the Ford umbrella and that they have to, you know, when the next version of Blue Cruise comes out, it's not just going to come to us and Mach-E. It's coming to ICE F-150, um, you know, and other vehicles is Lincoln. There's, I didn't even begin to talk about Lincoln. Right. You know, they have Blue Cruise too. So um, it's in, in, in different cars, Aviator, Nautilus. I mean, you just go on and on. So it's, it's fascinating to see, um, you know, this rollout. And I really, I am impressed with what they're doing. I mean, early Mach-E days, things were slow. Like things were very, very slow, but still, I mean, at a pace that was faster than most of the industry, you know, obviously not Tesla or Rivian, but you know, good. Um, and they've sped up a lot now, but we still, you know, we, there's definitely some growing pains and can't wait to see what things T3 fixes. Cause I do think, like you said, it's gonna, it's gonna change a lot. I think what's cool about this too, that um, you just touched on with all those nameplates, right? Is that um, what they're doing so smartly is they are integrating this stuff that we as EV people think of and are, are anticipating for T T3, they're integrating it already. 
into some of their mm-hmm. ice platforms. They're already learning from this stuff. And yeah. I think one of the keys to this whole idea of transitioning to an EV uh, world, some of this kind of will be the whole idea of uh, you, you boil the frog slowly, right? So it doesn't hop out. And so some mm-hmm. of these are little, if, if you start to make your ice vehicles look and perform and have infotainment systems and blue crews and all of these integrations similar to an EV. And one of the big problems now is you get into an EV and it doesn't feel familiar. It doesn't feel right. You know, like, like correct. Right. And you're you're trying to learn from scratch, but if, if slowly you're boiling the water of ice vehicles, integrating and making it more compelling and making it feel then eventually the transition to EV is less scary because it's yep. just like the infotainment that you have in your gas. Only now it's a different energy source, a domestic, possibly even your own energy source if you've got solar. Sure. Um, so I love that as well. And I, I love that they're going to continue uh, having – they need these ICE profits to be there to make this transition because you don't have the trillions of dollars of of angel investment capital at risk. You're, you're, you are – I've compared it mm-hmm. to – you uh, compared it to you have a, a very advanced uh, turbojet prop plane in the middle of your flight mm-hmm. while you're still flying, you're still delivering passengers, you're trying to convert that into a jet engine. And so that plane still has to fly and you've got to take the money you're making to convert each prop one at a time into a jet, into a jet, into a jet. And yep. you got to keep that thing flying and you're doing it um, while wheels are in motion across multiple different sizes and nameplates and you're trying to change your supply chain. You're trying to do it all. I think it's a daunting task, and I think they're doing it the right way. So I, yeah. I'm, I, again, I've said it a million times. I'm a fan. I'm biased. I get it. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of compelling things they're doing. I think they are ahead of the game in ways that are not yet appreciated. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and taking software out of the equation, right? Like we had an F-150 hybrid, <laughs> and this is why I had – preached the praises for hybrids i i understand it's the in a lot of people's eyes it's the worst of both worlds you know maybe yeah. not a plug-in you know i i get it but i will tell you from personal experience it's why we why we bought a mach e it's why we bought a lightning having that power that power boost hybrid was what made this light switch go off Ford did a lot of work on the 21 and up f-150 in general they they redid the interior the exterior had some big changes um but the interior was a huge update it it allowed for ota updates more uh advanced ota updates we could get little ones before but it, what they weren't what they were you know post 2021 so it, you know getting in there having that tech that jump it up in tech the jump up in the interior quality but then having that all electric mode on that hybrid we're like wait a second like we love it quiet. We love not having the transmission, like things that I never thought about because I was always a petrol hut. I grew up racing go-karts and sprint cars and, you know, four wheelers and that, that I always like loved gasoline. That was my thing, but I never really thought or really had really driven an EV, you know, a couple times in the Tesla Uber, but like not driving myself, you know, post 2019 or so, or pre 2019. So I all I hybrids I think are huge because I really do think that they will sell people the EV lifestyle. I, I at least can speak from that and you know personal experience. I think there's other ways that other people will learn and you know get in their first EV too. But I really do believe that that was what you know catapulted. I know that's what I, th- I think it's one step farther. And I, I've I've said this before, but I, I think that the plug-in hybrid specifically can be a really good transition step for a lot of people that are yep. hesitant uh, to dive into the space, but they you know, want to have some of the benefits and perks and savings. And obviously, you know, we talked about this, I think when we were talking about the Dodge, um, whatever that Ram charger, the, the Ram, Ram charger, charger yeah. that they call it. Yeah. Where they have a hundred mile range for a plug-in hybrid, and then the gen- on-site generator will kick in, and you can get like a six hundred mile range out of a uh, twenty-eight mm-hmm. gallon tank or whatever it is. Um, you know that that to me practically makes a lot of sense for the average consumer because if you're towing, you have the gas to back you up. If you are um, driving on a road trip, you don't have to deal with charging stops. You can just use gas if you don't feel like using um, or or trying out the electric network. Um, so, I mean, I think for the, the average person, the hybrid and the plug-in hybrid is a good intermediary step, 
Um, but then obviously there's those people that have gone straight in, um, which is what I did. I, I drove gas vehicles yeah. my whole life, drove an F-150 up until the day I uh, pulled onto the lot and picked up my F-150 Lightning. And, you know, for yep. me, it made a, a ton of sense and worked great and all the monetary uh, savings from the fuel and the amount of driving I was doing and everything just made sense for me. But, you know, for those people hesitant, there is that middle space. And obviously, like I said, there is the concerns with extra parts and componentry and things for maintenance that would take a little bit of extra consideration. However, it gets you kind of into the space, at least in the short run, to kind of experiment with that space and getting used to plugging in your vehicle once a day with the plug-in hybrid and getting that 20 yeah. kilowatt battery charge that you can get 30 mile range to get to the office and back and do it all electric. Um, and I do think there will be people that don't want to plug in, you know, um, and I think that's fine too. Um, I think, again, offering choice is so important. Like, I would love to see Ford offer that plug in hybrid for those people that want it. But I also think that some truck guys love the Power Boost hybrid because they don't have to plug it in. You know, they're like, oh, I just, I always have a hybrid, you know, and while that doesn't me- necessarily make the most sense for efficiency and all those nerdy things, what matters to them is that they're, it works best for them, right? So I think it's it's fascinating. And that, just and to that see. power boost hybrid gets you uh, twenty three miles to the gallon versus twenty. <laughs> yeah, but, and, yeah. It, and it yeah it may not and it may not be a huge huge gain, right? But I mean, I know for us that still saved us, you know, yeah, twenty thirty bucks a month, and for us that was huge. But it it just got us into the mentality of driving in a silent mode, which made yeah. us go, oh, actually, we like that, you know. Oh, so yeah. I think just offering people choice, like the Apple Car Play, you know, thing. I think is the way to go for the vast majority of, you know, these circumstances so that people can really decide what they want and build it. They'll come, you know, build great products. People will buy them. Um, you know, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens, you know, with T3. I think T3 is just going to, I think, I really do think it's going to blow people's mind. I have not seen it yet. I have yeah. no, you know, I don't have any idea other than, you know, what everybody else has seen, but I just think it is going to, be next level. I I really do truly believe. I know Elon said that he thought Cybertruck was like the the product of all products in the last century, right? I think that product is T3. I I really do believe that. I know I'm forward bias, but I think that is the product that is the next gen F150 where people go like, "Whoa, like this is this is the next step for where we're headed in this industry." Yeah, and there's taking I, a lot of time to research it and get it developed. So I think that there's going to be a, a really cool announcement whenever they decide to give us information on it. <laughs> yeah. I, I always, th- you know, um, I always took the Cybertruck with a little bit different perspective. I was almost like a technology demonstrator. And in a lot of the ways that, that Ford is kind of learning as they go with things, to me, Tesla has put a lot of money into the Cybertruck. It's going to sell whatever they can produce for the first couple of years for sure. But it's like a technology demonstrator where they're going to be able to take and do spend R and D money uh, on innovating this, you know, the 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 Ethernet that they're using, the forty eight volts of steer by wire, the Optimus servos that are being used in it, and you're doing it on a premium product so that eventually, when you build the factory in Mexico, that's going to do the smaller, more efficient mm-hmm. vehicles, you're not starting from scratch at that point. You've started doing some of this research on on a more expensive you know six figure cyber truck and now it's going to make it a lot easier when you go to scale something that's going to use some of these technologies to get the efficiency and the scale and the price point and the simplicity and so i, I just think- hope though that those technologies are actually going to be worth what they say they're worth do you know what i mean by that oh sure that's the sure. biggest yeah. problem we've had with tesla in my opinion at least is that we're promised huge gains, like 4680 is a perfect example, right? Like we are promised that it is going to blow everything out of the water, not only when it comes to performance, but efficiency and money and all these, you know, profits and all these things. And it's been arguably worse. So it's, it's, it's tough, but I agree with you. I think Tesla does all these great things. They push forward. They really push, they, they get things going but then when it really boils down to it, they kind of are like, oh, well, we kind of oversold it a little bit. But, you know, but it's still good. And it is <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. It is yeah. good. It does push the industry forward. But at the same time, it leaves you with a slimy feeling, right? It, this like greasy, like, well, why don't you just be honest? And and then, you know, I know Kyle Connor has talked about this a lot, you know, like, just be honest. And and we still will take the innovation for what it is. But but you don't need to oversell us. We just need the the honest truth of what the, what the product's going to be and what it 
you know, what it's going to offer and for real world consumers, right? Physics always bats last. That is, that's certainly true. And physics doesn't sell, right? It just doesn't sell. Right. It doesn't. No. <laughs> do, do we want to close out with speaking of technology demonstrators when, and, and about performance, right? Like uh, we, we had the, yes. yeah. the switch, uh, we're switch gear. It. Switch gear. I was going to call it the wrong thing. Yeah, the there's, switch gear. Like, uh, there's, we there's not much that gets me excited. But when they <laughs> dropped that, when Jim Farley posted that photo online, I was like, oh, yeah. man. I uh, For yeah. years and years and years, my dream truck was, uh, was a Raptor. I was like, I almost pulled the trigger on one. But going back into the use case of my life, I was getting 22 out of my F1, like miles per gallon for the F-150 <laughs> that I had. And I was spending five, six hundred dollars a month on gas, and the Raptor looked Crazy. so <laughs> tough, but it, it would get it would get twelve to thirteen miles to the gallon. I was like, I just could not justify going from six hundred dollars a month on gas to a thousand just to have a cool looking truck. And uh, so I let that go. That the moment the lightning rolled out on the stage, I was like, Yep, that's the one. That's what I want. I, I want that one because that's you know it had the best of both worlds. I got the efficiency. And I got the full size truck and I got just a cool looking vehicle, utility, all that. But then Jim Farley posts uh, and Ford posts the lightning switch gear, which is a performance model that they've, yeah. that they've illustrated. However, they raptorized the lightning and mm-hmm. it looks amazing. It's hard yes. to ignore. I know uh, Patrick and, and Liv got to go out there from Mach E vlog and Patrick got to take a ride in it and they got air in that thing. And it's, um, and the, you know, they, they said, these are all things anybody with enough budget could do, right? Yeah. It's not, well, the, 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 the Mach-E 1400, you know, you're not going to go do that, but you right. legitimately, if you had enough budget and time, you could do these things. Most, most Suspension, of the things. fenders, um, yeah. yep. just some basic mods, but I mean, the average consumer won't do it, but sure. I'd always yeah. said I was waiting for them to do the announcement for the Ranger Lightning or not the Ranger, the Raptor Lightning, uh, which this is pretty darn close. It's but fun to take it's that a thing for a spin, truck. To take that for a spin would be pretty dope. I wish they yeah. would have. Uh, it looks like what they did is they took a Lariat and they up XLT. Is an XLT? It's, it's, I was it's like, an XLT. Yep. It has the the gray grill and not the black, but for that look that they did, I think the black grill would have looked real sharp on it. But that's just my <laughs> opinion. Yeah, it's that. It's yeah, that, it, you know, it's cool. The the one thing I when I went and saw the Cybertruck in person, and I, I spent you know a lot of time on it, and then I went back into the parking lot, and it struck me how uh, how vertical the the F one fifty was, and it just didn't have that squat squished, but that that you know uh, switch gear. Because it's got yeah. those wider fenders and the bigger tires, it it gave it that stance that I think the Lightning inherently uh, kind of has that bland, traditional look, which is part of what's endearing and, and inviting about it and what makes it so approachable and, and easy to transition to. But it's not going to make your heart skip the way that that, that, that switch gear does. And when you see it, it's it's pretty hard to to not. Now I'm sure the efficiency. I'm sure the efficiency oh, on sure. that one is going to be terrible. Point <laughs> uh, seven. What are you getting yeah. out of that point? Se- I'd love to see yeah. that. I don't the think ra- I've seen the range goes from uh, the estimated three twenty down to like two twenty, but it looks yeah. cool. <laughs> hey man, I'm getting, I'm getting two twenty today. So if you're telling yeah. me I can get two twenty out of it, be an ER battery. Yeah. But you, it's not. It's not undoable. I really yeah. do expect though to see T three. Um, move in that direction now i don't i don't necessarily expect like cyber truck looks right i i kind of expect sort of a mix between the two like a raptor meets i i think ford knows raptor sells right i, I it just does people yeah. love it people see it uh they want one like that's just that's always been the case with the raptor um and so i i see ford leaning into that i really do into the into the looks of that i see it being wider you know uh more aggressive um but it will be fascinating to see, like, where does that utility of the F-150 Lightning meet up with T3? Because that is such a seller for F-150 Lightning and F-150 in general. It just, it, the utility of it and using your same accessories that you've been able to have. Um, but now we got to transition to something different, right? That will sell 
to not only early adopters, but perhaps, you know, a younger generation even, or even just, you know, people who want something a little bit more exciting than, like you said, like the traditional truck look. So how does Ford blend that together with a product? Um, it's going to be fascinating. It really is. I think like you've kind of mentioned before too, Chris, there's going to be sort of a, I believe, a, a line of products. Uh, T3 is just not one single product, in my opinion. I think it will be a, New it will be a product, of, yeah. But I do think there will be a specific T three of some sort. It won't be called T three per se, but you know, it'll be called something. And then there will be sort of offshoots of that. I think, I hope, um, I, I could see that definitely happening, though. Um, and it's just going to be fascinating to see what direction they go for. And um, you know, we already know though we're not going to have some two hundred kilowatt hour battery. You know, it's not going to be probably, hopefully, I mean, maybe it'll top out about 100, but I think there'll be, you know, much more affordable versions. I don't think we'll see just the top of the line version right at first, like GM2, right? And only that for, let's say, six months to a year. I really do think Ford is going to try to, you know, do what they did with Lightning and, uh, you know, allow all sorts to buy. So it's going to be fascinating, but I really do think it's going to be like a more wider aggressive look i think i cannot wait to see it i cannot wait to see it i'm yeah. looking forward to it i'm excited well, whenever we get it. the t3 announcement we'll have you back on to talk about it because uh it's something that Sounds we all share good. a mutual excitement for and we'll yeah. uh yes. we'll share that excitement whenever we get some sneak bits that we're allowed to talk about and will we see it in 24 that's going to be the most interesting i've done my best to try to ask the people i know like <laughs> hey is it just just tell me if you can 2024 no yes and i just i'm not getting anywhere so it'll be interesting i don't even know if they know per se you know i mean i think there's so much at play you got to build a factory too which is huge um so it's gonna be i just can't wait it's gonna be exciting josh you and jesse need to go do some recon we need to get some of those uh, drone yeah. shots i mean you know give us we're, give us some we details. are working we're working right now um <laughs> We're working right now uh, to get some infrastructure potentially located um, near the Blue Oval facility, uh, awesome. very near, and so uh, th that's something that we're actually going to be in the region. So I might, uh, I might see what type of uh, top secret intel we can get. But yeah, we're also we've also been in communications with Ford directly about um, some of what we're doing, and so I've, I've, I'm prying where I can. But like you guys, it leads to nowhere. So yeah, I feel guilty sometimes when I, I I I have to ask and I don't get anywhere with it, but uh I try to nudge, try to nudge our buddies and uh um, yep. no, they're they're very good at what they do. They're they're, they're seasoned, yes. They're well seasoned, seasoned veterans, <laughs> yes. Well, highly skilled. We will find the weakling. Yeah. <laughs> just just a matter of time. I feel but, you know why I feel it? I feel like our best approach is going after Jim Farley himself. Oh yeah. Like we need to get right. him out. Get him in a car. He likes lock, the car. Lock him, lock him in a room and tell him he can't leave until he tells us about it. Yep, you're right. Uh, we're we're going to formulate had... a kidnapping plan here on the podcast live <laughs> for everybody. Jim had his uh, his podcast with Kelly Clarkston, um, mm -hmm. who I just loved that she's, she's a truck girl. She's got a 250. She's got a Lightning. A lot like uh, Tom Malagny talks about how the Lightning is her favorite car to drive. I think that mm -hmm. speaks volumes about the truck. And, uh, and so I dropped a comment on it and I'm like, uh, like, Hey, we need to get, we need to get you on our podcast. And, and he liked it, <laughs> but I don't know if he liked it or if he's got an admin liking it, or if he just like, just goes through and likes the hundred things he likes, but I'm like planting the seed, Jim, please like, yeah. let's get you, let's get you on. So our tens of listeners can, uh, build <laughs> the secrets, right? Like let's, uh, let's get you over here and you can bring Kelly Clarkson along with you too. No harm in that. that. I, w I wouldn't have that. How cool is it though to have Jim like involved in all that stuff? You know, he tweeted oh, to me this morning, like I was trying the Apple classical music app yesterday and it was just crashing. And, you know, he's just tweeted to me this morning, thanks for sharing that. You know, and I just love that he's yeah. involved. It really has nothing to do with Ford, you know, but he knows as a human. that, you know, yeah, as a human and they have a close relationship with Apple and just, you know, he enjoys seeing these things. And I think that is genuinely the best part about Jim is that he's involved. He wants to see it all and everything, not just Ford, not just racing, yep. not just whatever. He really wants to see it all to learn about how to make his company better. And I think that's that's all he could ask for. Yeah, he's an Absolutely. automotive guy. He works for Toyota. He's got his connections, his friendship with with Elon. He's got his his guys that came from Apple. Um, yep. Right. It's all he just wants it to be a great 
compelling, exciting product because he's a car guy at the end of the day. And it really comes through when you hear him talk about it. And uh, I just think, and I, you know, before Kelly Clarkson, there was Sanjay Gupta, whose parents, yeah. uh, mom, I don't mom and dad or just mom was an engineer at Ford. Um, so it just, again, it's just that uh, to listen to him talk and have these conversations and the interviews that he's seen, you know, um, we got to meet him in person. And that was just, again, so endearing you know he's like he comes up and introduces himself you do not need to introduce yourself to me yeah <laughs> I just, you know yeah. and, um you know in my case he signed he signed my truck for me which is one of the coolest things you know that if i ever you know trade the lightning in for anything i'm taking that that visor with me it's not uh it's not staying <laughs> with the truck so Either that or you mark the truck up 50 grand because it's uh signed <laughs> by jim yeah. farley so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, he's just a really great guy. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's part of the reason I have so much faith in, in what Ford's doing and the direction they're going. I think he's making good choices and he's, he's a lot like, uh, I, I just resonates with me cause I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate Tesla. I do a lot of things in the Tesla community. I appreciate lucid. I appreciate Rivian. I think those are all compelling and great in their way. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, we, they've had the whole, like, uh, who would you marry? Who would you whatever. Right. But, uh, I'm marrying the lightning. That's who I want to go home with. That's what works for me. Right. And I, I appreciate though, that for others, it's a different, it's a different answer. Yeah. And I think, I think Jim appreciates that in the marketplace too. So Absolutely. yeah, I, I think it's uh it's in good hands as long as he's steering the ship. There's room yeah. for everybody at the table. And there's a lot Absolutely. of, there's a lot of people and a lot of vehicles to sell. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's something that, that as the transition to, uh, evs grows it's something that obviously there's there's plenty of different use cases like we've discussed but we are at an hour and a half which would probably be our longest podcast episode ever so <laughs> yeah we probably should cut it off uh just even though we're in the middle of a good conversation we probably should cut it off just for the sake of the listener who's endured this yeah. long right but i will say before we go make sure check out uh rolex 24 this weekend i'm really excited for it um ford's got a huge 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 uh uh, you know, showing this year with the GT3, GT4. Um, I think, you know, the whole using racing and putting some of those things into your consumer product, particularly when it comes to EVs, um, I think is going to be huge. So for all those listeners and you guys, I think Rolex is going to be really fun this weekend. Absolutely. And if you uh, want to uh, comment or recommend something, you can visit us at our website, turn down for what podcast.com. Or uh, follow us on X or any of the other platforms. X is TDFW Podcast. Uh, you can feel free to drop us a comment and give us some thoughts on today. Uh, we're also on YouTube and things. But yeah, give us a comment. Let us know what you think. So Also, and Chicago Auto Show. Um, I want to yeah. shout that out real quick. Uh, uh, lightning, uh, biggest lightning meetup so far, probably. Um, I think we're going to have like two or three different clubs. I know Great Lakes, Midwest, maybe one more. Um, but if you can make it come, it's going to be amazing. Um, I think the 10th is technically the cars and coffee date. So, um, I know more details are kind of forthcoming here shortly. Um, but yeah, check that out. We, well, thank you, Jace, uh, for being with us today. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Uh, if you are listening and want to follow Jace, it's Jace Craft Miller. Uh, that's his tag. So follow him as thank well. You but, very uh, much. We'll, we'll connect again soon, I'm sure. And uh, Sounds good, guys. Thank you for listening this week. See you next Look, week. Like, like, and subscribe. Turn down.